So in organic chemistry, you're going to see this word a lot. Isomer, and all that means is that you have the same molecular formula. with different structures. So even though a, a molecule can have uh, the exactly, exactly the same types of atoms and a number of atoms, uh, they can be arranged such that you have two completely different compounds and they behave completely, in completely different ways. So. Isomers can be broken down into constitutional or structural isomers. And uh, stereo isomers. Stereo isomers can be broken down further into diastereomers and these are the common cis and trans isomers that you see a lot and then you can also have enantiomers and enantiomers are probably the trickiest to identify because they, they look the most similar to each other but they're actually uh, pretty different in the sense that they are non superimposable mirror images of each other. For example, let's take. Uh, Something like your hands. Okay. Here a quick sketch of the left and the right. What you find is that your left and right hand, they look very similar, but you could never have uh, two left hands. Right? They're, they're mirror images, they're alike in every way, but they're non-superimposable. In other words, um, if you try to put a right-handed glove on the left hand, it wouldn't work. Uh, because again, they are non-superimposable mirror images of each other, and they're very different. Okay, so you have a left, you have a right. And this is similar to uh, molecules. So if you started out with, let's say, carbon in the center and uh, let's surround the carbon with uh, four atoms all of different sizes and what we'll do is we'll put the smallest one into the board which is what that dotted line means and let's keep it simple we'll just do all halogens so we'll put the fluorine here which is the tiniest one and then coming out of the board we'll put the largest one iodine and the bromine here and the chlorine here and if you're not sure about the atomic weights uh, you can always go back to your periodic table so you have uh, iodine is largest than bromine than chlorine than fluorine and if I put the smallest one into the board so that I'm actually facing the uh, the other three uh, and this three dimensionally kind of looks like um, like a camera on top of a tripod and let's say if the camera was the smallest item it would be uh, actually on its side and, and the three legs would be pointing at you if the sizes go in the direction such that number one right here which is the largest goes to number two in this direction and then to number three so that it's actually counterclockwise this is an S isomer. Let's try um, its non-superimposable mirror image. So if we start it with 
the carbon. And again, let's put the smallest one into the board. That's the fluorine. And if we surround it with uh, three other halogens, all of a different size or uh, atomic weight, let's again take the largest one, iodine, coming out of the board. And what we're going to do is, the other two guys we're going to switch. We're going to put the bromine here and the chlorine here. Now again, you have a, a situation like a tripod, uh, the smallest uh, part of it. Let's say if this is a camera, it's on its side, it's going into the board, and the other three legs are coming out of you. But now if this is the largest one, which we'll label as number one, and this is the second largest one in terms of priority, that's number two. And of the remaining three halogens, this is the third largest one. Now what you have is in terms of size, the direction is going clockwise or to the right. And righty is for R, or R is for righty. And uh, that's why this is an R isomer. Okay. So a, a good way to do it is if you um, are able to arrange a molecule so that the smallest one goes into the board, you just have to look at the remaining three. If it's going to the right, it's going to be an R, otherwise it's an S. And this is used in the uh, world, real world uh, all the time. For example, if you have something like phenyl, it's acenic acid, and we draw it out like this. Benzene ring is coming out at you, and uh, I'm just going to do the shorthand uh, stick configuration. And all that means is that since carbon and hydrogens are so often seen in organic chemistry, every point is a carbon. And you should know since carbon holds four bonds how many hydrogens are assumed to be attached to it. So this would be like a carbon attached to three hydrogens, where this carbon here would have only two hydrogens because that's all it could fit. The other one's attached to this carbon here. Okay, so this carbon here would be a uh, double bond of this oxygen, a uh, single bond to another oxygen here, and single bond to another carbon here. So those four bonds are already uh, included. So this carbon wouldn't have a hydrogen. So let's uh, first take a look at the uh, chiral center, which would be right here. And the chiral center or chiral carbon is just the center where the action is taking place in terms of classifying this as an enantiomer. And it needs to be atoms of four different um, sizes or entities of four different sizes surrounding it, which implies that it has a non-superposable mirror image. So let's first take a look at um, what's uh, surrounding this chiral carbon. Well, it's only attached to uh, three uh, other atoms. So we can apply here that the fourth one must be a hydrogen. Let's put that hydrogen, a dotted line going into the board. Okay, we'll draw it out. So now all four um, um, bonds of the carbon are accounted for. And if you're wondering why uh, carbon has to have four bonds, well, it's because the valence electrons have to be um, all incorporated into that carbon. It's a group four atom, right? So Let's, uh, again, we look at um, this as if it were a camera. Let's say the camera is going into the board. The three legs of the tripod are coming out at us. And now we need to rank these guys. Problem here is that you have this chiral carbon attached to one, two, three other carbons. So what you need to do is you need to see what's attached to that carbon. Okay, so first let's take a look at this one. This carbon here is attached to um, two hydrogens and one other carbon here. Okay. So one carbon, two hydrogens. Okay. 
again, I'm looking, since these are all carbons, you have to kind of take it one step further and go one more, which makes it a little bit tricky, but they practice makes perfect. So if we go to the next um, atom surrounding the chiral center, which is this carbon here, you look at this guy, this guy's attached to two other carbons. Okay. And now what we have is And now for this one, this carbon here is going to be attached to an oxygen and another carbon. One oxygen, one other carbon. So in terms of the ranking, this has to be number one because it's got an oxygen and oxygen is heavier than carbon and hydrogen. So we put this as number one. Well, the second one could be either this one or this one. This one's only attached to one carbon and two hydrogens, but this one's attached to two carbons. Even though they're both attached to carbons, it's attached to two, this one takes priority in the ranking because carbon's heavier than hydrogen. So this is two. And that was, um, this was this one here. The last one's got to be three, which is this guy here. So the fact that this goes one, two, three in this direction, counterclockwise means that this is the S isomer. Okay. Let's draw a phenyl succinic acid a different way. Okay, we'll still draw the phenyl ring coming out at you. But now what we're going to do is we're going to flip these guys here. So we have something like this. And this is just a group like that. Now, we just flipped it around this chiral center here, so that's where we got to start again. And let's draw the fourth uh, entity or atom going into the board, and that's a hydrogen. So the hydrogen's going away from us. That can be our camera, where the three legs of the tripod are now looking at us. These, these are the three legs, these three carbons here. But the problem is that they're all carbon, so we can't rank them just yet. We have to go once, one um, step further and look just beyond this carbon to see what this carbon's, what, what, what these three carbons are attached to. So let's take a look at, um, Let's do this one first. This is uh, this carbon is attached to an oxygen and another carbon. Okay, this carbon here is attached to two other carbons, and that's it why this carbon here is going to be attached to the two hydrogens which are uh, invisible and another carbon so the ranking has to be oxygen first since it's the heaviest or heavier than carbon and hydrogen so that was this guy here that would be number one the one with the two carbons second, since the two carbons outweighs the one carbon and the two hydrogens, which was this guy here. And then for the third, it would just be the remaining carbon. So since this goes one, two, three in a clockwise direction to the right, is the R isomer. If you have 
two of these guys in equal amounts when you synthesize something, uh, which happens a lot um, in the drug industry, you have what's called a racemic mixture. So for a racemic mixture, you have 50-50 RNS. Or SNR, same thing. There was a drug that came out uh, a while back called thalidomide, and they made it, uh, but when they synthesize it, they uh, produce both RNS isomers. It looks something like this. Benzene ring. carbonyl group here, actually to become a, an amide, and this bond here would go, let's say, into the board, and this is going to be a six-membered ring, I think that's it. And uh, you have the other one, kind of looks like this. Almost exactly the same way, except for one thing. This bond here could also possibly come out of the board. So I'll draw it filled in line like that. And another six member ring. Boom, boom, boom. I think that's right. <clears throat> and uh, what you have here is the S isomer and the R isomer. And what they found was that this uh, compound as a whole, this drug, particularly R, was great to treat pregnant women with morning sickness. What they found out accidentally was that uh, it was the S isomer that can be very harmful. And uh, it turned out to be teratogenic, meaning that it caused mutations in the uh, fetuses of the pregnant women. And if you recall the example we used of a, uh, a, a let's say, a left hand only fitting into a left-handed glove. Well, drugs kind of work the same way in terms of their uh, receptors that they fit into. These are all three-dimensional shapes, and uh, seeing that uh, a lot of these receptors or enzymes are made from proteins, uh, the amino acids that make up the proteins, those guys are chiral too. So there's really only one configuration of the R or the S that can sometimes uh, fit into a particular area. So you can have different biological effects uh, depending on the enantiomer you're, you're talking about. So what they found was that this S isomer uh, fit very nicely uh, into the three-dimensional shape of the double helix and the DNA of the fetuses and unfortunately it um, bound itself inside to cause mutation that led to, uh, uh, I don't really know what the technical term is, but uh, the, the arms and the legs didn't grow all the way, and it kind of looks like a, uh, almost like a stubby uh, arm. Um, but it, again, the, the, the point is that uh, the, the reason why you have two very different effects is because even though S and the R isomers look very similar uh, when you're dealing with three-dimensional shapes, uh, especially in terms of uh, drug receptors, uh, DNA, enzymes, and proteins, uh, these guys can fit into um, these um, things in very different ways.